is this is a talk that I, that is going to summarize uh, some of some of the papers that I've been uh, writing in the last few months. Uh, so uh, Carlos uh, asked me what paper you would you would like to present, and I couldn't uh, make my mind make up my mind. So I I decided to to present several papers instead of one. Uh, all as you will see, they all fit in the same sort of broad agenda. And I have called that agenda the intended and unintended consequences of uh, the peace agreement in Colombia. Uh, so m all of these papers uh, that uh, make part of this agenda are joined with Moon Prem, who's my colleague at Rosario. Uh, and then uh, we have different co-authors in different in, 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 in different papers. All right, so let me just jump in, in, into it. Uh, so so uh, let me just uh, very briefly, I am assuming, and probably this is the wrong assumption, and I apologize for that, uh, that you are a little bit, at least a little bit familiar with the, with the, with the Colombian conflict. So I'm not spending a lot of time talking about that. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex uh, conflict uh, that uh, has been going on uh, for some people. Uh, has, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but it's a conflict that has been going on for, 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 for quite a few decades. Uh, so it, you know, it's like a multi-party conflict, kind of complex. So let me just summarize it uh, on the risk of being uh, uh, too much uh, of uh, too much simplistic. Let me summarize it in one slide. So it's, it started uh, with FARC and ELN in the mid 1960s, at least the current or the most uh, recent phase of the conflict. Uh, in the sense that Colombia is a country that has suffered from civil war from uh, its uh, uh, birth in uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, there were many civil wars during the 19th century and uh, a few uh, during the 20th century. Uh, there was a big civil war uh, that caused many, uh, many victims in the 19th, end of the 1940s and 1950s that was called La Violencia. Uh, you know, but the current conflict, you could, you could say it started with the formation of uh, the big guerrilla groups, FARC and ELN, in the, in the mid-1960s. Uh, they both claim to represent the rural poor, uh, you know, and a few characteristics of this conflict, the subnational territorial dominance is an important objective of the, of, of the, of the armed groups. And uh, one of the strategies to achieve this uh, territorial, subnational territorial governance is civilian victimization. Uh, you know, this is not only in Colombia. This is this is uh, a common strategy in civil wars that has been identified by a broad uh, literature, especially from political science. Uh, you know, I'm emphasizing these two points not because uh, they're necessarily the two most salient points of the conflict in Colombia, just because I'm going to be using these two facts and explaining these two facts in in, in, in what I'm going to present today. Uh, the conflict then, uh, you know, it was a low intensity conflict and it es escalated uh, a lot in the, in the late 1990s with the involvement uh, in illegal drug uh, trafficking uh, by both guerrillas and paramilitaries and the consolidation of paramilitary groups under an umbrella organization called the AUC uh, in 1997. Okay? Uh, paramilitary groups uh, started as self-defense groups in the late uh, 1970s, but they sort of joined forces under one uh, umbrella organization in, uh, in mid-1990s. So this uh, made the conflict to escalate uh, a lot, uh, at least until uh, the end of 2002, when there was a uh, uh, you know, uh, ceasefire uh, of the paramilitaries that start that started peace negotiations with the with the government of President Uribe in 2003. So uh, after this uh, sort of uh, short uh, peace negotiation with the government of Uribe, paramilitary groups demobilized between 2005 and 2007. Uh, but there are many groups that actually the fact didn't mobilize, didn't mobilize and uh, and uh, and remain active still now. Till today, and these are what they call neo paramilitaries or criminal bands. Okay, so I'm emphasizing this, uh, you know, the three party uh, uh, nature of the conflict, and some of the some of the things that I'm going to be important in what I'm going to talk about. 
So let me now jump to the, to the good news, uh, which is peace in Colombia, okay? Uh, so after uh, five, more than five, over five decades of civil war, in October 2012, the Colombian government of FARC started, uh, they started even before, but officially started uh, peace negotiations. Uh, one important aspect of this peace process uh, between the government of FARC is that other armed groups, other active armed groups, were left out, right? Uh, because of the nature of the conflict, essentially, uh, essentially, it was uh, or is still super difficult to sort of coordinate uh, all the groups in a multi-party conflict to uh, sort of uh, enter a negotiation at the same time. Um, one of the and and this is going to be very very important in the rest of my talk, so let me emphasize this. Uh, so this was a four-year a four-year peace. Peace, uh, 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 peace uh, negotiation that that ended at the end of 2016 with the with the final peace agreement, but uh, probably the most important milestone uh, during the peace negotiation was the establishment of a permanent ceasefire, uh, unilateral ceasefire by FARC on on the 20th of December 2014. So essentially, in the middle of the peace negotiation on the 20th of December 2014, in order to signal that uh, credibly that they were willing to, to, to end this negotiation with a peace agreement, and also to show to the government and to the other uh, party in the table that they were a unified force uh, that, that, that could articulate all, all uh, the fronts, they said, okay, we're going to start a permanent uh, unilateral uh, ceasefire. And in fact, the ceasefire was largely met with uh, two very small exceptions, uh, was largely met and was replaced by the bilateral definitive ceasefire in August 2016 and the subsequent uh, uh, laying down of, of the weapon, okay? Far, FARC's offensive activities uh, dropped by 98% or over 98% during this period. So the ceasefire actually worked. And this is important because even if the peace agreement wasn't uh, hadn't come to an end. This was extremely important for, as I said, for uh, the FARC to credibly signal that they were willing to sign the peace agreement and that they were uh, a, a unified a unified force. And this is what actually changed the balance of power in the territory because there were most you know a lot of Colombia was uh, controlled by FARC. Uh, or under the dominance or gov illegal governance of FARC, when the FARC stopped shooting, stopped using the weapon, this changed the balance, the balance of power in the territory, and this is something that I'm going to be exploiting in 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 my in my uh, in in the talk. Now, so there are um, so this is what I was talking about the FARC's inability, so they tied their hands, right, inability to respond violently during the ceasefire constitute a window of opportunity for two th at least two things. One, legal and illegal economic activity to jump in in these areas, okay? Uh, and the attempts of other armed groups to establish dominance in these formerly, uh, areas formerly controlled by FARC. Okay, there was a vacuum of power and uh, this constituted an, ex an incentive for economic activity, either legal or illegal, and for other armed groups that were still active, as I mentioned before, to try to establish dominance in these areas. And this is exacerbated, these incentives are exacerbated by the fact that the government failed, failed to occupy and build institutional capacity and state presence uh, in FARC strongholds. And I'm talking about the former government of President Santos, but also the current government of President Duque. Uh, they have largely failed to, 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 to establish uh, state capacity in these territories. So these these are key ingredients of what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so there is a peace negotiation. There is a big milestone in the in the middle of the peace negotiation, which is a permanent ceasefire by FARC, which was largely met. This changed the balance of power in the territory. This creates incentives, both economic incentives and, pol and political incentives, for other armed groups that still exist to try to establish dominance. Okay, and this is exacerbated by the government not uh, doing enough uh, to establish uh, some sort of state capacity in, in those in those areas. All right, this uh, this sort of summarizes the timeline uh, of 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 
of the recent uh, political events in Colombia, uh, President Santos uh, started in uh, August 2010. So, you know, the first school semester of Santos was first semester of 2011. So this is Santos 1. Okay, Santos 2 starts, uh, Santos was re-elected, and Santos 2 starts in the second semester of 2014. Uh, the peace negotiation starting in the second semester of, two, of 2012. And that's the lavender line, and you see some sort of the milestones that uh, were to be in the peace negotiations. Uh, uh, and one important one, as I argue, is the ceasefire that started in the first semester of 2015, because the ceasefire was declared on 20 December 2014. The implementation stage started in the in the in the first semester of 2017, because the final agreement was signed at the end of 2016. Okay. Um, okay, so keep in mind this, this, this picture because I'm going to come back to it uh, in a while. Okay, so what are the consequences of peace? So there's, I, I've been studying this uh, broader question of what are the consequences of the peace agreement in Colombia. This is, as I mentioned, a, 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 an agenda that is uh, in uh, cooperation with Moon and Prem, and it includes at least four, uh, four uh, broader outcomes. One is Human capital accumulation, and for that we're looking at the educational outcome, outcomes in a paper with Olga Namen, health outcomes. Uh, as I mentioned also, the consequences of that in terms of legal and illegal economic activity. So we're looking at firm performance, also growing, uh, deforestation, uh, and also two more outcomes, civilian security and electoral outcomes. Okay? Electoral outcomes is, is, a, is the least advanced of these projects, essentially because the first uh, local elections are going to take place next month. So what we're doing, because may, maybe many people are, want to look at this, is that we are already uh, getting our do files ready and writing the introduction and the paper. Everything except the tables and the interpretation of the results, to be able to release that paper uh, very soon after the election. Uh, you know, these academics have to be creative in, in this competitive environment, not to discourage uh, students, okay? So this is the broad agenda, and what today, what I'm going to focus on is uh, three of these sort of uh, questions or papers. I'm going to talk about educational outcomes, and then I'm going to talk about deforestation, and finally I'm going to talk about civil, uh, uh, civilian security, okay? And this, this doesn't match sort of the, the timeline of, of these papers. Actually, it's the reverse timeline of the papers. We started with the third paper and the second and the, and, and the first. Uh, but I think it makes sense to, to go through in this order today. So quantitatively, quantitatively studying the effects of the peace agreement uh, is, is, is challenging, of course. And to that end, in all these uh, papers, we're going to exploit two sources of variation. The first source, source of variation is the temporal variation that is given by the permanent ceasefire. So if we go back to this picture, you have the, the before the, the, the start of the ceasefire and the, and the after the start of the ceasefire. And we argue this is the key moment that changes the balance of power in the territory, okay? Because you have FARC being an armed force before the ceasefire and then FARC not being able to shoot back and at anyone after that. Okay, so that's gonna give us a nice sort of temporal variation, uh, but that's not enough. We are going to use also cross-sectional variation and the cross-sectional variation is going to be given by, by far presence or by far violence prior to the ceasefire, okay? When I say or, I'm not substituting present with, substituting present with violence, we're gonna measure presence and violence in different ways. Uh, uh, so essentially, this, gonna, this is going to give us nice uh, cross-sectional variation uh, for, for, the different, for the different phases. How do we measure far presence? So presence or territorial control is something that is uh, difficult to observe by nature in a systematic way uh, that is unbiased, right? You cannot ask that in service because uh, people who ask the service are going to be intimidated by who has the power in the territory, and you don't have that in administrative records either. So we just uh, by, you know, we follow some previous literature in the Colombian conflict and other conflicts in the world and say, okay, in order to establish something similar to uh, governance in the territory, you need to have inflicted violence at some point in the past, okay? 
So we're going to look at the uh, incidence of violence in the extensive margin and call the dummy equal to one if there was at least one violent case involving FARC during the crisis fire period uh, after Uribe uh, took office. So from 2011-1 to 2014-2. Okay? Now, this is presence and exposure to violence. We're going to use the same data, but we're going to uh, code a uh, a uh, uh, violence exposure to FARC dummy equal to one if the number of attacks is a, a FARC is above the 25 percentile of the empirical distribution of attacks by FARC, conditional on there being at least one attack. Okay, so in the extensive mind. Uh, so we want to 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 uh, differentiate municipalities that have been highly exposed to FARC violence from municipalities that have not. Okay. The source of all this data is the violence data set that was initially compiled by uh, Restrepo Spagat and Vargas uh, and was updated uh, through uh, 2014 uh, by, uh, by us at the University of So the first, as I mentioned, the first thing that I'm going to be looking at is the hum what we call the Human Capital Peace Dividend. This is a very ambitious title. Uh, but it's just uh, looking at the educational outcomes and the effect of the of the of the peace agreement on educational outcomes. And as I mentioned, uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not particularly precise when I when I say when I say that these are the effects of the peace agreement. But because because of because of the fact that the temporal variation that I'm using is the start of the ceasefire, not the peace agreement per se. Okay. When do the peace when do the after peace agreement start? Is much more endogenous and there is no precise date because the, the peace agreement was signed first in uh, September, but there was a referendum in October that rejected it. There were some changes to the peace agreement, uh, and then it was signed by Congress uh, in December, right? And this is much more uh, exogenous, far, uh, endogenous. Far, FARC's announcement of a ceasefire was much more exogenous. So uh, we look at, uh, we're going to look at uh, the effect of that on educational outcomes. So of course, there's a lot of a long literature on the effect of conflict on uh, on educational outcomes, and there's massive evidence that individuals in conflict affected areas reduce investment in education in terms of years of educational attainment, uh, school completion, and these. There's also a lot of evidence that this has negative long-term consequences, for instance, in terms of uh, lower labor market and health outcomes in adulthood and productivity. Okay, so there's lots of literature. What's the effect of conflict on uh, human capital? But there's not much uh, on what's the effect of the end of a conflict, okay, on human capital. So the, there is there is an important question in the literature, which is can conflict affected areas recover from this after uh, a, a conflict stops? Okay, but this is not necessarily the case. If you think, for instance, that the conflict uh, was very destructive to an educational infrastructure in a way that after the conflict stops, rebuilding the educational infrastructure takes a lot of time, and therefore catching up with human capital accumulation is difficult. For instance, okay. So the answer of this is not obvious. It's not like it's just the flip side of the coin. Of the coin. So the existing evidence of behavioral responses to the end of the conflict, there is some that focuses on either combatants or veterans. Uh, in particular, there are papers by Josh Sanders looking at the, uh, at the effects of veterans of the, of the end of the Vietnam War. But there is no evidence of the effect of the end of conflict on civilians, which is arguably is the most important population that would, would be affected in terms, of, or in terms of human capital accumulation. So this paper tries to fill this gap. And for that, we're going to focus on, uh, as, a, as an outcome variable, on dropout rate, school dropout. So we're going to uh, have data at the municipal level. Uh, for that, we're going to construct dropout rate at the municipal level. And our dependent variable, which is the dropout rate at municipality I in year T, is essentially uh, adding across schools, so S is a sub-index of, of schools, ac across the schools of all, of, of all the schools in a municipality, the number of dropouts from the beginning of the academic year to the end of the academic year, right, in each school of, the, of each municipality, uh, relative to the total enrollment at the beginning of the year 
uh, in that school in that municipality. Okay, so we have that at the school level, so it's great. And then we're adding that at, adding that at the municipal level because our treatment, which is uh, the interaction between the start of the ceasefire and, and municipalities that were uh, controlled by FARC, is at the municipal level. Okay, uh, so for that we're using yearly administrative school records that from, from the school census in Colombia from Dania and the Ministry of Education. So see, this is going to be our main dependent model. Uh, we have, as I said, two sources of variation, the, ta the timing of the permanent ceasefire and the cross-sectional variation given by whether a municipality was, uh, was affected by fog presence before the ceasefire. Uh, so the first, the first is a time dummy that is called cease, and the second is a, is a cross-sectional dummy that is called fog. Okay? So this is the empirical strategy. Essentially, is a difference in difference strategy in which we have municipal municipal fixed effects. We have we have department time uh, time fixed effect. Uh, our coefficient of interest is going to be beta, which is the coefficient that uh, comes with the interaction of uh, the uh, time dummy with the cross sectional dummy. Okay, so we're going to look at what happens with uh, dropout rates. In municipalities over time uh, after the, the ceasefire relative to before the ceasefire, in municipalities that were affected by far by far uh, prior to the ceasefire relative to municipalities that were not affected by far. These are the two differences. Okay? And we're going to control by uh, you know uh, a large set of predetermined controls. Uh, multiplied by the ceasefire dummy. So effectively, we're doing what we're doing is controlling by uh, for differential trends parameterized parameter by municipal characteristics measured prior to the ceasefire. Okay. So this is this is uh, this is our regular diff in diff strategy with two wave fixed effects and and differential trends. Uh, okay. This this is sort of uh, the results in 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 a snapshot. So this is uh, actually so. This I think the vertical line should should should, should yeah the vertical line should stay there because this is the, uh, this is when the ceasefire started. Uh, essentially, what we have is that uh, dropout rates are going down in the entire country before the ceasefire. Okay, but they're going down uh, equally in uh, part. Affecting municipalities relative to non-fact affecting municipalities. Of course, the level is different, but the, what, what's important is that the trend is the same. The trend is very similar, right? And what we're capturing is the fact that after the ceasefire started, dropout rates go down uh, faster in park affecting municipalities relative to non-fact affecting municipalities. Okay, so you see that these trends are parallel before, and then the difference shrinks after the ceasefire and shrinks because dropout rates are going down a lot faster in park of continuous abundance. All right. Uh, this is just this is just looking at uh, the change in the school uh, dropout and exposure to fire violence. So red red dots are exposure to fire violence. Uh, and and then this is uh, blue municipalities are municipalities in which in which the dropout uh, the, the in which you have an absolute drop in the dropout rate, an absolute reduction in the dropout rate after this is fire relative to before this is fire. So what's important is that you see a graphical correlation between the presence of a red dot and the dark and the darker uh, blues. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, the in terms of the regression results, uh, this is this uh, this these are the main results. So essentially, this table shows the coefficient associated with the interaction of interest of the different diff strategy, and the dependent variable is in all cases the school dropout rate. And then we have here different sources, uh, different different uh, kind of uh, regressions. The first three is sort of the dummy that I define as having been exposed to park violence in the past. Okay, uh, so this is just. Uh, I'm being exposed to fire violence with the dummy that I define as being above the 25 percentile of the empirical distribution of attacks of fire. Okay, 
And essentially what we have in the first uh, regression is municipality fixed effect and year fixed effect. But in the second, we change the year fixed effect to department year fixed effect. So we have fixed effects that are year specific and department specific. And in the third one, we have that plus we add the uh, municipal level controls interacted with the uh, CIS dummy. And in all cases, you see that there's a reduction of uh, about from 13 to 19 percentage points in school dropout. Uh, and here, what we have is uh, a dummy of the municipality is highly exposed to value. Okay? For that, we're using another dummy which is not above the 25 percentile, but we're using a dummy uh, in which the municipality is, ex is, is exposed to violence in the 75 percentile and, and up. Okay, and that, what, that's why the coefficients are, are, are a lot a lot bigger uh, because uh, because this essentially is uh, is saying that the higher the violence you have been exposed in the past, uh, the bigger the drop in dropout rates after the start of the ceasefire, okay? Okay, and then because this is a deep in deep estimation, we need to, we need to, the, 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 the main identifying assumption is that there are parallel trends. So we already saw that the trends seem to be parallel uh, uh, before the start of the ceasefire. This is just visual inspection, but in the, in the context of our regression uh, of, our, of our empirical strategy, what we do is that we do a very flexible dynamic within the specification of a, an event study in which instead of having the ceasefire time dummy, we interact the FARC dummy which, with the fixed effects of the uh, semester before the start of the ceasefire and after the start of the ceasefire. And essentially what we get is this, showing that before the start of the ceasefire, there is no significant difference in dropout rates controlling for uh, fixed effects uh, at the municipal and department time fixed effect. No significant uh, difference in, in, in dropout rates in municipalities that were exposed to power violence and not. But after the start of the ceasefire, there's a differential, differential drop in dropout rates in municipalities that were affected by power violence prior to, to, to the start of the, prior to the start of the ceasefire. And that that is persistent over time. If anything, it increases in magnitude over time. Okay, so the gain in terms of human capital uh, is increasing over time. Right. In terms of robustness, so we can uh, we can do a bunch of robustness exercises. One is uh, just looking at the extensive margin of park attacks, not above the twenty five percent of the empirical distribution, but just. Uh, just at least one attack, or attacks above the median, or or measuring FARC uh, violence by by whether there have been selected killings by FARC. Uh, this is one in which we choose the controls uh, by by choosing the optimal number of controls uh, using machine learning techniques. Okay, this is one in which uh, instead of putting all the controls and uh, multiplying them with the ceasefire dummy. We just uh, use all these controls to predict uh, violence by far prior to the ceasefire, right? And use the propensity score as a one-dimensional uh, summary of all these controls and interact it with the post-ceasefire dummy. Uh, this is one in which the control municipalities are not the rest of the country, but municipalities that suffer some sort of conflict, but not for violence. So violence by other armed groups, which are probably more comparable. And uh, this is far in which we truncate the sample based on the P-score in order to get rid of municipalities that are not comparable in order to their prior propensity to have suffered far violence, okay? So this is where we're just playing with the definition of the treatment bubble or with the or with the definition of the treatment group, just to show that our results are robust to all this and are not just coming from the way we're defining things at the beginning. And what's important is uh, what what explains it? What explains it? What is the main mechanism? So you could think of two broader set of mechanisms, okay, or three or three sets of mechanisms. The first ha has to do with, with 
uh, child soldering. So recruitment of children into armed groups, uh, which is a big thing in, in civil war and in particular in Colombia, uh, by some account, uh, there were about uh, seven, 17,000 children recruited uh, in the armed conflict through the duration of the armed conflict uh, to the different armed groups. So it's quite substantial. So maybe this is all just showing that when the ceasefire started, FARC stopped recruiting children, especially in municipalities in which it was more active. And these children that were not recruited went to school and these decreases drop at rate. Okay? Could be that, or could be just overall victimization. So I'm not sending my kids to school because it's too dangerous, because there are shootings all the time in this municipality, or there are landmines, or it's just too dangerous to send my kids to school. When the conflict, when the conflict ends by the, with the ceasefire, now things are safely so I can send my kids to, to, to school. Okay, so it's, there, these are two different explanations. And the third one maybe has to do with, uh, with, uh, with the fact, with the fact that, uh, FARC activity is associated with illegal drugs. Okay. And when you have presence of illegal drugs, for instance, coca growing, you have more children recruited not to fight for FARC, but to take care of the, of the, of the, of the coca crop. And therefore there's child, not soldiering, but child labor. Okay. Right, so we're going to look at these mechanisms. The way we're looking at these mechanisms is by looking at heterogeneous effects, where there are heterogeneous effects according to municipal characteristics. So the first thing is to see if uh, there is, uh, if we look at dropout rates in primary versus secondary school. Why is that? Because if there is child soldiering, uh, you see that this should be differentially higher uh, for the case of dropout rates in secondary school, because these are the children that can carry heavy weapons and move faster in the in the in the in the in the woods. Okay, if they're in secondary school, because if they are too little, uh, it would be a burden to them to recruit them. So this has been documented for Africa. Okay, the fact that we don't see any differential effect in primary versus uh, secondary school uh, shows that. You know, it goes against the interpretation that this is that this is child soldering. The other way of looking at, at that is to look at the heterogeneous effect by gender. So if this is if the drop in if the decrease in dropout rates is higher for boys than for girls, this is consistent with the story of of, of child soldering because uh, even if there are women that are part uh, combatants, uh, you know. The soldiers are disproportionately men, and the, and the recruitment of children is disproportionately biased towards towards boys. Okay, so the fact that we don't see any differential heterogeneous effect parameterized by uh, gender is also against uh, the potential mechanism of child soldiers. Okay, uh, we don't we don't find any differential uh, effect by whether the school is rural or urban, or whether by the school is public or private. Okay. When we actually look at things that could get us closer to the victimization potential mechanism, we do find interesting heterogeneous effects. Okay? So, for instance, we find that the decrease in dropout rate is even bigger. There's an even bigger decrease in terms of the absolute magnitude in places uh, in which there are other armed groups uh, in the past, in places that were which there was a lot more violence because, because these were contested places. So violence was higher, and because violence was higher, the gain in terms of human capital is bigger, right? Which is consistent with the victimization mechanism. It's also consistent with the victimization, with the victimization mechanism uh, that in places in which there were more landmines victims in the past, so places that, uh, that in which uh, victimization through the land being mined uh, was higher in the past. The, the reduction in dropout rates is higher after the ceasefire. It's also consistent with the victimization mechanism. So it seems that the evidence seems to support the victimization sort of mechanism and not the child recruitment mechanism. 
And then finally, we looked at what happens in places that are more suitable to grow coca. So in places that are more suitable to grow coca, you see that the reduction is lower. So there is an offset in the reduction of dropout rate, which means that because these places are more suitable to grow coca, uh, the opportunity cost for children to go to school is higher because what's the alternative? The alternative is go to the coca sector and 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 get and get uh, and get paid for that. So that also, you know, is consistent with the fact that the extent of illegal economies reduces the extent to which you could have a, a human capital gain from the end of coca. All right. So this is this is uh, kind of what we do in terms of the mechanism, and you know because I I, I have to go through uh, other papers. Let me just jump into what we learn from this uh, from this evidence. So this is fire imply large reductions in terms of school dropout in municipalities that's affected by fire violence. So it's about twenty percent of the sample dropout rate, right? So there's a reduction that is. Uh, that amounts to 20% of the sample dropout rate, so it's quite substantial. Quite substantial. Okay. Uh, the results are explained by a reduction in victimization, not by the return of child soldiers. The effects are significant across, across gender and age, and the effect is higher in more violent municipalities and attenuated by potential coca growing uh, driven child labor. Okay. So this is. So much for the good news so far. As I said, there is a big agenda in which we're going to look at sort of formal economic activity and other things uh, that we haven't gotten there yet. So I, it's not that I can tell you lots of like good consequences of the peace agreement. This is one. Uh, now I'm going to talk about deforestation and, and, civilian, and, and, and civilian targeting. And I'm not going to tell you many, many good news uh, related to that. Yeah. Whether um, in the last table, um, did, you, did you guys explore like some of the potential uh, things happening at the school level that might be also like, yeah, like for example, let's say in these places in which uh, we now have the ceasefire, it is possible that some teacher, maybe better teacher, just decided to move there and that might be affecting also like the drop that's a great question. So, I, we do have that table, I didn't show it. Uh, to cut tables, and I and I I hate to tell you that I cut the tables that you're requesting, but uh, you know it's in the paper. Essentially, we look at school level characteristics, uh, for instance, the quality of the quality of teachers, and we don't see any of that changing. Okay. Okay, great question. Thank you. Okay, let me just jump into the second paper, which is we call it end of conflict deforestation. It's also with Munu and Santiago Saavedra, and uh, sort of. Uh, so, how, how can violence? This is this is uh, this is a typo here. How can violence? How can violence exacerbate, uh, attenuate, or erase the process and trends? This is important because lots of uh, the countries in which there is incidence of conflict also have uh, tropical forests. And the forestation, you see, is a big issue uh, right now in the world. So there were big demonstrations this uh, weekend, precisely because of climate change and and and, and the forestation. So you could think you could think that there are two broad sort of uh, theoretical arguments about the relationship between uh, conflicts and the forestation. This is conflict, uh, right? Uh, so one is that okay, conflict can reduce deforestation if armed groups uh, use forests for forests to hide, or if investors fear potential extortion from armed groups, or if armed groups sort of their govern in, in, in their broader governance, they behave as a as an environmental authority, putting quotas and restrictions to economic activity. If that is the case, conflict may be associated with lower deforestation, okay? But on the other hand, you could think that conflict can increase deforestation if there are economic activities that fund armed groups that are resource, resource, intensive in resource extraction, okay? I'm thinking about illegal mining, for instance, 
which is a big deal in many countries in Latin America. And I'm thinking about uh, oil exploitation and, uh, you know, uh, illegal, illegal crops such as poppy and coca, which uh, can also end up in deforestation. Okay, so so the question the, it's it's an empirical question. So how uh, what what what's the relationship between conflict and the first stage? So so this is this is Colombia and this is uh, this is uh, forest cover and, and and the first stage. So hot spots. So this is just a correlation. I'm just showing here and I'm just showing that of course uh, red places we have that that are the pixel level for very small pixels, thirty meters by thirty meter because we we're using satellite satellite level data. So we have deforestation pixels, which are the red dots, okay? And then we have forest cover, which is the green area. And of course, you see that uh, this, I'm not claiming any uh, direction of causality here. You see that there is a lot more deforestation in areas that are a lot more deforested. This is obviously uh, uh, the, the egg or the chicken kind of uh, uh, question, okay? This is just to motivate things. So in terms of data here, we're, as I said, we're looking at 30 meters times 30 meters satellite deforestation pixel from, from, for, for the time period 2011, 2017. And this comes from the Global Forest Exchange. So this is public data that you can download from a website that is for Global Forest Exchange for the entire world, okay, if you're interested. What we're gonna do is uh, for, for every municipality in GRT in any specific year, we're going to look at the deforested area, deforested area by by adding pixels, okay, and relative to the forest cover in 2000, which is the first year for for which we have deforestation data from this source, okay. A second measure could be relative to the previous year, but of course, the if we if we look at the previous year and it's already past the ceasefire. This is going to be endogenous to what happened after the ceasefire. So we want to anchor a baseline year, and for that we're using the, the, the first year that we have data on. Okay? But the results don't change anymore. This is super this is super interesting, and it's gonna be, I think, if this is my bias, the main contribution of this paper, which is which is the following. So my our co my co author uh, Santiago Savera came out with this idea, which I think is super clever. So imagine that this, this square here, which is uh, of 25 pixel, uh, is a municipality, okay? And that you take the snapshot of that municipality, uh, you take the snapshot of that municipality in 2017, which is the last year we have data on, okay? And then you know where, where is forest, which is the green area, and the white, uh, the white area are deforested pixels in that municipality. The numbers tell you the year in which the deforestation took place in every pixel. Why do you know that? Because you have time varying data on deforestation. You take, you take the snapshot of the last year and you back up and look at the same municipality year by year and code when each pixel was deforested, okay? So, uh, so with that, you can code whether deforestation was granular or massive deforestation, okay? So, so let's, uh, every year, so let's see, let's say that we want to code for each pixel whether deforestation, deforestation in 2015 is gonna be part of a larger deforestation patch at the end of the period, or is going to be part of a small deforestation patch at the end of the period, okay? And we, and we can play around with how we define what's a large versus a small deforestation patch. Uh, we can play around with that. You can use one hectare uh, all the way up to 10, 10 hectares. We take a very skeptical view of that, okay? But let's say that uh, we look, we know that these two pixels were deforested in, 2000, in 2015, Okay, and in that means, and this is not at the end of the period that is going to be surrounded by green. So when we go back to 2015, we said that these two pixels are part of a small deforestation patch. So we call that granular deforestation. So this is consistent with what? This is consistent. Why is this important? So let me 
I should have started with this. Why do we care about this? So let me just jump into the results. We're gonna we're gonna find that there's a large increase in deforestation after the ceasefire in areas that were previously controlled by FARC. Okay, there's a large increase in deforestation. So this might be good. The, I mean, this this might be consistent with different with different uh, explanation. One that is not so bad, if you want, is that okay, the peasant that was displaced from this municipality that wa was kicked out by the angle uh, returns to his or her municipality after after there is after the start of the ceasefire uh, to recover his or her land and start exploiting her land. So it's you know, part of the returning strategy of peasants, and that line is very small, so you, you're gonna have small deforestation patches, right? That is not that bad. The other one is not that the peasant return, but that there are large economic businesses that are just occupying the municipality and tearing apart the forest altogether. You know, in terms of policy, that's probably not what you would want, okay? So this is important to try to distinguish them. And of course, we can now go the entire country and survey patch by patch whether this is a small peasant or a big multinational. So what we do is this. So we can call that this in 2015, this was going to be part of what at the end of the period we could code as a granular deforestation patch. And these two pixels cells were deforested in 2016, right? And to, were deforested in 2015 and we know that by the end of our period, that, that's going to be part of a big deforestation patch. So that's what, that's how we distinguish between granular and massive deforestation. Okay, because we want to get into what explains what we're finding. Is it granular deforestation or massive deforestation? So what do you think it is? Is it just peasants, peasants going back to their land? Or is it just big economic businesses that just go and tear apart the Apart the, the, the forest. What do you think it is? Come on, this is Latin America. I'm not talking about like you. It's, yeah, it's like it's, it's business. So, and that what's cool about this is this is not cool at all, but what's important for policy is that when you do heterogeneous effects by state capacity, whether you have state institutions that can regulate these sort of things. This of course concentrates in places in which there is no state capacity. So it's definitely like unregulated, thirsty uh, 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 industrial and agriculture. Okay, so this is the evolution of the ceasefire, uh, this is the evolution of deforestation before and after the ceasefire. And again, you see that there is more deforestation in areas that had far present prior to the ceasefire, less deforestation in areas that did not have a far present prior to the ceasefire. What's important is that after the ceasefire, there's a wedge that is that is uh, increasing uh, between the two types of municipalities. So this this is the diff in this type, type of picture. Uh, and in, these are the main results. So in, in terms of the empirical strategy, it's exactly the same empirical strategy as I said before, uh, which is the diff in diff. Uh, deep in deep uh, uh, specification with municipality, department of fixed effects, and in some sort of specifications you control uh, for differential trends parameterized by municipal characteristics. So uh, essentially, uh, this is just showing you that deforestation increases on average 12, uh, 0 0.12 percent points in municipalities with former far presence after the ceasefire. And this is equivalent to about a quarter of a ton of a standard deviation of deforestation. So it's quite big. Okay? Deforestation, importantly, is increasing in the entire country, right? This is consistent with the with the peace agreement, uh, attracting businesses and, and foreign direct investment and all that, the peace, the peace agreement. So uh, incentivizing economic activity in the entire country, right? But this is the differentially bigger and by a big gap in these policies that were previously uh, dominated by FARC. Okay, what's the difference between these two uh, uh, regressions? In this one, we have year fixed effects, and in this one, we have the primary year fixed effects, and the results are virtually the same. And this is sort of the dynamic graph uh, that I showed before, 
uh, that is important for two reasons. One is to show that there are parallel trends prior to the start of the ceasefire. So no differential changes in deforestation uh, in uh, treated and controlled municipalities. The municipalities with park presence versus no uh, prior to the ceasefire, right? But after the ceasefire, uh, there's a big differential increase in deforestation in, in municipalities that have that have park trends, okay? Not only there's a big difference in increase the same, but that's increasing over time, which is consistent one with what we saw here that the, the wedge is going uh, is 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 being is made bigger over time. Right. This is some robustness by showing that uh, this this is uh, in different different columns control for different municipal level characteristics as measured uh, in a predetermined way prior to the fire. Interacted with the sea fire dummy, or you can just control for all of them at the same time, and the results are the same. Uh, and as I showed in the previous table, you can just do show robustness as to how you measure things uh, and whatever. I mean, I just uh, this is robust to a bunch of things uh, of how you measure fire presence. Or how you measure deforestation. This is the dynamic share, so relative to the previous year and not relative to 2000. If you think that relative to 2000 is kind of arbitrary, you can do it relative to this year. The results are exactly the same. Uh, this, is not this is not measuring the area deforested by the number of pixels in each municipality that are deforested. It's the same thing. This is just not weighted by the forest cover in 2000, uh, and if anything, it's bigger. And, and this is a placebo, a placebo exercise, which I, I, in all all honesty, I don't remember what that is. The good thing is that it's called placebo before before I use before I show not the non significance. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm ashamed, but you know, how to put together a three paper presentation? You know, uh, I arrived last night at midnight. Right. So this is this is the this is the interesting part of so in the other paper. So what are the mechanisms here? Okay. So first, what about state presence? This is sort of the the sorry, I'm moving where I, I'm not supposed to move. So uh what about state presence? So I said this sort of the broader, one of the broader things that's coming out of this research agenda is that the peace agreement is you know, I think we all agree. Uh, I think we all agree uh, uh, that it's a good thing in Colombia. Not everyone agrees. Uh, I'm not. I'm not getting too political uh, because this is being recorded. Uh, you know, after after you uh, shut down the camera, we can get political. So I think we all agree that the peace agreement is a good thing. Now, uh, one of the main take-home points here is that by not having been uh, by not having come together with the efforts from the government to establish some sort of state capacity and institutional presence in the territory, you see this sort of unintended negative consequences, right? So if you measure state presence uh, prior to the ceasefire, so state capacity prior to the ceasefire, uh, then you see that uh, this is all explained, the, 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 the decrease in presentation is all explained by places in which there is low state capacity, also, if you measure judicial capacity, so the capacity of the judiciary to work independently and effectively, this is also exacerbated in places in which there is, uh, the, there is, uh, not, not exacerbated. This is, so again, this is state presence, right? So this is reduced and of, totally offset in places in which there is state presence, and there is a reduction net reduction in deforestation in places in which there is more judicial capacity. Uh, and then you see that this is exacerbated in places in which there is cattle ranching, right? So one of the businesses that, it, that is explaining this uh, tearing apart the forest is cattle ranching. Uh, this is not differential in places in which there is coca suitability, so it's not, doesn't seem to be explained by the arrival of the coca business, so it's more the arrival of legal businesses, which is interesting and also important for policy, and is also uh, is also differentially larger, or according to this coefficient, uh, offset by the further where you are from military bases. 
if you're closer to a military base, the deforestation increase is larger, which means that, uh, in some sense, is suggestive that the military is actually helping uh, these big businesses uh, do their thing in in this area. Okay. So one thing that we can do here, which is interesting, is that because our data, our dependent variable, our dependent variable is not at the municipal level, our dependent variable is at the pixel level. So we can exploit within municipality variation, which is which increases a lot the credibility of these results, because within municipality variation is keeping constant everything within a municipality exploits different parts of the municipality. So we can do that with this uh, estimation strategy that has a municipal characteristic, right? Times the seas, times uh, the presence of park. And we have here, uh, uh, so let's say that the municipality characteristic increases the presence of nat national parks. Okay, I'm going to explain why that, that, that's important. So this is, this is fixed effects of National parks times municipality or municipality times time or national parks times time. Okay, so we, we have all sorts of two way fixed effects that control for anything that can go on in this municipality. And then we're looking at whether this is bigger in places or smaller in places that have national parks. Why is that? Because that's a nice measure of differential state capacity within a municipality. So in national parks, you have authorities that are looking after the national park and to some extent preventing these businesses to arrive to the national park, right? Keeping all the municipal characteristics, characteristics constant. So, uh, oh yeah. Oh, well, I'm really sorry. I, I, yeah, sorry, sorry. Time, time went by, uh, by a lot. So essentially, what we find is that this is that this is all explained by what's going on outside the national parks. So if anything, deforestation goes down in national parks. Okay, which is a nice proof of uh, within municipality state capacity, and also that this is uh, this is massive and not granular deforestation, which is what I talked about uh, uh, a few minutes ago. Okay? Right, so let me, let me skip these conc conclusions and I'm going to finish, as I said, in four minutes. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, so these unintended consequences have to do with, uh, not, as I mentioned, not complementing these important uh, peacemaking milestones with state building efforts and good governance at the municipal level to avoid an intended negative impact. And another negative impact is what happened uh, with civilian uh, civilian security, okay? So let me just not go through these, but remember this picture that I showed you before? Now let's look at something that in Colombia we call leaders uh, uh, sociales. It's a big issue in Colombia right now that they are killing social leaders. Why they're killing social leaders? Social leaders are local community leaders that mobilize the community towards a, 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 a joint goal, okay? They're being killed in Colombia massively, massively. Over 500 local leaders have been killed in the last, in the last uh, few years. Uh, so this is a really bad thing and no one, no one understands why, why is this the case. Let's look at the time, at the time uh, evolution of that. Look, there's a surge huge surge in the king of social leaders right at the start of the ceasefire. People say that the king of social leaders in the press you read that this had to do with the implementation of the peace agreement. Right, but it started well before the implementation of the peace agreement. It started with the start of the ceasefire. So what, what, what is this paper about? This paper is about showing that because of that vacuum of power, okay, because of that vacuum of power that was created by the fact that FARC stopped being a a, a, a bellicose force in some municipalities, but the peace agreement did involve other armed groups, right? And these are valuable territory, territories. So these other armed groups and the government didn't 
make any effort to consolidate their presence in these territories. Other groups came to these places to establish dominance. And one way of establish, establishing dominance in the in territorial contestations in civil war, and this has been documented by the literature, is, kill, is selectively killing civilians. Selectively killing civilians is not just take two civilians at random, it's just let's get at the local leader and kill the local leader so I get the allegiance of the rest of the population. So this is how we explain what's happening in terms of, local, in, of killing local leaders in Colombia. So of course, you have like uh, the empirical strategy and all that, but let me just show you that in places that in play, you see that this is the number of local leaders killed across the territory in our sample period. If you overlay that with places that far that have far presence prior to the ceasefire and are exposed to other armed groups because the vicinity of other armed groups, these are the places where social leaders are being killed. Okay, so I'm going to uh, 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 go, uh, jump all this, and this is just showing you that how uh, lo local leaders are being killed in places after this is fire in places that were dominated by FARC and are exposed to other armed groups. Okay, but that this is not that the overall homicide rate is increasing in this area, and and this is just civilians counted uh, in the overall homicide rate. Okay, so it's not like massive uh, uh, indiscriminate killings, it's just select, selective killings of civilians. And you're not, you're, you're, and, and those being killed are com, uh, pre, uh, leaders of Junta de Acción Comunal, right? And conflict related organizations. So, precisely those that are most important to kill if you are not a group that one. Uh, to gain the allegiance of the population, not necessarily Afro-Indigenous people or other type of leaders such as uh, minority leaders. Okay. All right. Yeah, and then the same heterogeneous effect and showing that this is exacerbated by land restitution and judicial inefficiency. So let me just jump to general conclusions, and I think uh, I'm sorry. I just I I, I put my 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 uh, phone here to to keep time, and I just forgot about that. Uh, so the re the 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 recent agreement is the most important political milestone in Colombia's modern history. This is my own take. I think most of you would agree. So understanding its unintended, and in, intended consequences is key to design policies to reap most of the reasons and minimizing the costs. Uh, so one way of trying to understand it is by exploiting this natural experience given by the permanent ceasefire. Uh, and there's, uh, there's an um, ambitious agenda that are going to be uh, exploiting during my sabbatical. And the findings so far suggest that uh, the peace agreement needs to be complemented by efforts to build state capacity capacity and bring institutional presence in the territory. That's it. Thank you.